So I like to think of growing a beard in the winter as adaptive intelligence, and uh, <laughs> that's how I take care of my uh, skin to look in the summer. So um, we're here today to discuss Hoboken. Um, the image on the screen right now is of our, our real asset, our transportation asset. So uh, out of Hoboken Terminal, we have every major form of transportation crossing the Hudson River, heavy rail uh, leading up to the station, subway underneath, ferry, uh, buses going in and out of Hoboken Terminal, and uh, the city's bounded by the Holland and Lincoln Tunnels. So um, as we looked at what makes Hoboken truly valuable, what, uh, what makes Hoboken unique, we have uh, incredible waterfront assets, and uh, the community uh, greatly appreciates uh, access to the waterfront. And we're also a very, very dense community. We're as dense as New York City, um, but we're much, much smaller at only a mile square. Uh, those two uh, attributes of Hoboken, uh, the proximity to the water as well as uh, the density of Hoboken lead to a number of different vulnerabilities. And uh, those vulnerabilities were laid bare during Hurricane Sandy at the north and south ends of the city were vulnerable to storm surge. On the western side of the city, because we uh, filled in uh, tidal wetlands, we're vulnerable to heavy rain events. Uh, and because we're a highly impervious area, uh, we have uh, very limited ability to infiltrate water, rain, uh, when we have heavy rain events. Um, so when we think about responding to those vulnerabilities, uh, we have to take care of uh, inadequate drainage. We have a combined sewer system that is not built to handle the type of rain events that are happening. Uh, and we have a bulkhead at the north and south of the city that was not built to withstand more severe and frequent storms. Uh, we know that uh, we are having uh, dramatic changes in our climate that are increasing precipitation events, the severity and frequency specifically that's accruing to the northeast. Um, and when we think about the size and magnitude of Hurricane Sandy, you can compare that to uh, Maria, Harvey, Irma, Florence. Uh, we see consistently that the storms are increasing in size. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be storm surges. You're talking about 30 inches of rain at a time, 48 inches of rain at a time. So uh, in the city of Hoboken, we are not looking forward to the impacts of climate change. We are experiencing them. Uh, we are responding to them directly. We are, uh, we use a term and we say the risk is real. It's a, it's a common thread. It's a common agreement. It's very difficult to talk about uh, how much money you put towards adaptation, what responses you have to these impacts if we're not in agreement that this is occurring. That's, that's a transaction that has to occur at every public meeting uh, with our public officials, and those conversations are different depending on the audience that you have, uh, similar to what we're going to discuss today. So uh, Hurricane Sandy impacts for Hoboken, uh, we had hundreds of millions of damages. This doesn't reflect damages to PSCG or the train terminal. Um, I want you to note that there's not angled parking on this street. The cars are actually picked up and moved from the floodwaters moving through the city of Hoboken. Um, and there are ancillary impacts to these kind of storm damages where one event is too much for us. Uh, one event every 30 years, one event every 50 years, one event every 10 years. We're still in the process of recovery. Um, we're still closing out public assistance projects uh, in the city of Hoboken. Uh, this is a particularly sensitive picture for me. This is my pizza spot on the corner of Grimaldi's. It's a block from my house. Um, and as people uh, struggle to get in and out of the city of Hoboken, evacuate, um, you'll notice the sheen uh, on the water here wasn't just uh, ocean water. We're talking about everything really mixing together in the city. So there are a lot of uh, contaminants uh, in homes, and it was very difficult to uh, recover quickly because of uh, oil or gas or debris. You had to rip everything out of your building. Um, and so when, when we talk to the public, we always come back to start from uh, Hurricane Sandy because the images are vivid and the images are real. Um, this image is actually from a heavy rain event. Uh, this is flooding on the western side of the city. There's one to two feet of water. If, uh, if we get a very high intensity rain event in a very short amount of time, so those those frequency, uh, the return frequencies on those are actually uh, becoming it's becoming more often for us. So uh, this is a condition that affects health and safety for the city. Again, this is mixing with sewage. And we have tomato plants growing on the corners. It's not because people planted them there. Um, and that, that's a joke, but it takes a minute for some people to catch up on that one. Uh, anyways, what we're, uh, what we're thinking about is a comprehensive strategy. We recognize that 
Um, events like Sandy is not something that we can respond to with individual efforts. On the bottom right side of your screen is our firehouse. Uh, recognizing the type of construction, uh, the connectedness, the age of the buildings, um, a strategy that provides a single solution to a single building is not cost effective for us. So the forces that are acting on our buildings and are acting on our city, we have uh, groundwater that's coming up from the ground. We have a very low groundwater table. Uh, we actually also have subsidence on the west side of the city. We have uh, sea level rise that's increasing. We have a tidally influenced river uh, that's changing how uh, or, or making our bulkhead more vulnerable over time. And then we have precipitation events that uh, change how our storm sewer system works. Um, so all of those factors, the risks, the value, the assets, uh, the challenges and complexity led to the Rebuild by Design project. Um, and so the reason we need that project is because of all the reasons I just stated, but uh, this slide shows our flood risk. So 70% of the city of Hoboken is within the coastal floodplain. Uh, that is the light blue area. The dark blue areas are the areas that we have frequent rainfall flooding events. So that's raw sewage mixing with rainwater coming back out of the storm sewer grates in the city. And we developed a four-part water management strategy. We being uh, the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, Royal Haskell DHV. This is going back to 2013 for the Rebuild by Design competition. Uh, and the four-part water management strategy, the resist elements of that strategy, uh, keep storm surge from entering the city, uh, and then the delay store discharge elements of the strategy, uh, manage uh, urban storm water. Delay is basically keeping water out of the storm sewer system. Store is creating additional capacity uh, underneath our parks on the western side of the city, and discharge is uh, active flood pumping measures. Um, and for the sequence of this presentation, we're going to first discuss the resist element, um, which is the portion that's been funded with $230 million by the federal government, and then we'll go on to discuss the stormwater management delay store discharge practices, which are funded by the city of Hoboken, uh, which we've contributed about $140 million over the last few years and we'll discuss the elements of those projects and their, their status today. And if we have time at the end, uh, we can also go over some of the challenges that we've had with uh, local ferry service in the city of Hoboken. There's a contentious issue about our Union Dry Dock property. Uh, we're building out a municipal microgrid, and uh, also we're doing uh, systems design and thinking, which is getting a little more complicated with some GIS work, but I think it proves interesting for uh, MDC. So we have gone through the environmental impact statement process and the NEPA process to arrive at a preferred alternative. What that means is we've submitted a project to the federal government within the budget, uh, and that meets the purpose of the project, which is to reduce flood risk. And the dark purple area on this screen uh, are where we're is the footprint of the resist alignment. So those are essentially going to be I and T structures that are concrete uh, that will rise out of the ground to a uh, specific elevation to keep storm surge out, and then the light green areas are uh, delay or discharge practices that are meant to attenuate storm water. So for the different designs, and the project team, because it's over, uh, not a large area, it's a little more than a mile square, but when you're talking about implementing projects within neighborhoods, uh, the project team thought it would be effective, and when I say the project team, this project is being led by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, which is the administrator of the project, um, and the commissioner oversees and ultimately makes these decisions about these projects, that they manage flood hazard within the state of New Jersey. Um, and the project design lead right now is AECOM and the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, um, and, and some of the images we'll reference here today were also produced by Dubery, who is our feasibility engineer. But they broke it down into uh, seven different design zones at the north and south end of the city that are related to uh, different tie-ins or different neighborhoods, and then also on the western side where there's going to be different uh, park expansion. And as we looked at designing all these different sites, there were a number of different drivers. So there was uh, the underlying function of what a uh, flood management structure needs to do, which is to prevent prevent or reduce, prevent is not really a term we use, but reduce flood risk. Uh, you can never really design yourself out of a perfect storm. Um, and that was uh, really basic principles of engineering, best practices, looking at uh, federal guidance, Army Corps guidance, uh, looking at uh, different design and distribution curves. But then there was also how this project fits uh, into the city. So as the project team looks at how to incorporate heavily engineered practices into a highly urbanized environment, uh, context really became king. 
Um, and as we looked at the context and how to implement, the project team started to slice the different resist investments into placemaking opportunities. So on the left-hand side, uh, we are going to be building uh, Harborside Park, which is about a two-acre uh, park investment that will kind of be the fulcrum of our northern protection area. Uh, and on the right-hand side of the screen, you have a service area. Disregard. Is it bad? Am I doing that bad? Do we have to stay out here? You called that in? I can just wrap it up. No Right of ways. So we have, I think, 30% of the city is our right of ways. And as those right of ways change, 
or as the demand for change occurs within the community, that's an asset we have to protect and utilize very, very carefully. Um, and so we, we think that we've accomplished that with this project, um, and we think that we're going to be able to implement within the schedule that the federal government has given us, so going into construction at the end of 2019 and uh, ultimately going into uh, or finishing and closing out the project uh, by 2022. So this is just another rendering of how we're using alleyways and right-of-ways to achieve a lower design elevation but still be able to implement <coughs> measures. I want to switch over real quick to show you a video of what that might look like as it's implemented. Um, and so we're going to start at the northern end of the alignment, uh, which actually ties into the city of Weehawken. So right now you're looking at the Hudson River between Hoboken and Manhattan, and we're going to zoom in uh, to where the project begins in Weehawken. And it's difficult to see, but the project... Oh, don't press the laser button, it starts the movie over. <laughs> So we're zooming into the north end of the project area. Um, the alignment is immediately to the west of the light rail tracks. And then we transition into that open park area that we were talking about at the north end. So there's a viewing deck, a beach, and um, we put people in the park to show context with height, how high it's going to be, about eight to nine feet above grade. Um, and these are existing buildings in the north end of the city of Hoboken. Uh, and the idea is to show that we are not going to be building walls within the city, but we're going to be building amenities that provide flood damage prevention. Uh, there's going to be a number of gates that go across different roadways. Um, again, we're at the western side of the parking garage here where you're providing screening with the alignment. This is across from a school. We hope to provide educational opportunities there. This is a private residential area where you see that there's not a lot of amenities baked in, but it's not just a straight line. We're going to provide additional features there. Uh, this is, again, going into over to Washington Street, which is our commercial area. You see the alignment continues to go lower and lower because the topography in this area continues to go higher and higher. And as the alignment reaches our design flood elevation, which is going to be about 15 feet above sea level, uh, it actually stops. And so we transition and we go from the north end of the city. Stevens Point is on your left right there, which is about 100 feet above sea level. There's not an intervention in the middle of the city of Hoboken. And then the intervention starts up again uh, as the topography goes down. The intervention starts at 15 feet and again goes back up out of the ground where this is more of our transportation area. So signage, wayfinding is more of a pass-through space as part of the alignment. Um, and at the south end of the project, we actually have um, two different alignment options. There was an option one and option two. New Jersey Transit has actually decided on a middle ground alignment. So the alignment at the south end of the city is going to be somewhere in between this red and the blue line. Um, and what that's going to do is enable a redevelopment area for the city of Hoboken, but also provide very similar flood damage prevention benefits. Uh, the project ties into the heavy rail tracks, which is elevated at the south end of the city, uses the heavy rail tracks as a flood protection feature, and then ultimately crosses Jersey Avenue, and you can see with the green wall at the south side, it wraps around our light rail track. So we use this as a tool in our public meetings, uh, going out and trying to educate the public about the Rebuild by Design project, um, and right now it's been very effective in helping people understand uh, what the project right mean in context. So uh, that project is on its way. It's, it's under design. I'm going to transition now to talk about stormwater management. How are we doing with time? We're halfway through. Halfway through? Okay, very good. Um, so the stormwater management projects that we're working on, again, we're focused uh, where the uh, resist structure is focused on the north and the south end the, to keep flood water out from these two blue lines, the two blue arrows. The stormwater management projects are focused on reducing stormwater flood risk on the western, western side of the city in the blue hash areas. Um, and we, so Sandy was a big storm surge event. Hurricane Irene was a big uh, rainfall event for us. I think it was a 50-year rainfall event, but we had two, two or three feet of flooding on the western side of the city. Um, we have a combined sewer system, and those sewer sheds are interconnected. Uh, interconnected sewer sheds mean that if it rains in one area of the city, it can flood in another area of the city. And the topography of the city of Hoboken is such that it will not flood on the eastern side, but it will flood on the western side, predominantly in our H1 uh, and H5 sewer areas. 
Um, and the reason why that happens is because the uh, stormwater mixes with sewage. The sewage conveyance system was only built to handle maybe like a two-year rain event. Um, so if you have a five-year event, you have water that's either going up into the streets or it's getting pumped out to the Hudson River. But the design challenge that we have is that our outfalls are located below high tide. Um, so what that means is if a rain event occurs, and it's high tide, then the sewage doesn't have a place to outfall and backs up on the So this has been an issue for a long time in the city of Hoboken, and we've really had to deal with uh, sewage in the streets for um, up until 2011. We did our first flood pump, uh, and now we uh, installed our second flood pump to deal with that. But we are also looking at, um, this goes back to 2013, green infrastructure is the predominant strategy. Storm sewer separation in the city of Hoboken is somewhere in the order of magnitude of a billion dollars. Um, so if you're looking at uh, New York City, for example, uh, complete separation of the system is going to be uh, very, very expensive. And because of uh, the complexity of opening up every roadway and changing, uh, how they can make stormwater is not a likely solution. So I think that uh, New York City is also following a green infrastructure strategy. Uh, and what that strategy says is uh, keep water out of the storm sewer system, create more space for it once it's in the sewer system, and if it's in the sewer system, then we ultimately have to discharge it. Um, and we're doing that with projects that are on city streets, and we're doing that with projects that are within city blocks and uh, a number of our parks. And uh, we have a whole host of different measures that we're using, uh, but ultimately we want to increase open space, reduce combined sewer overflows, uh, and mitigate the effects of flooding. Uh, so this is an image outside of City Hall. We did a, uh, we legalized rainwater harvesting in cisterns and uh, we implemented those practices to uh, all around the City Hall. I think we can get to a later slide to attenuate a 25 year rain event. Uh, we incentivized green roofs. Uh, any new construction projects in City of uh anywhere between $800 and $900 a square foot. So putting a 40 or 50 foot roof deck on the top of your building is a big incentive. Um, so we, uh, we've seen hundreds of thousands of square feet of green roofs go in since we provided the incentive to do that. It's another way of uh, keeping stormwater out of the system. Uh, we have uh, entered into redevelopment agreements. So the 7th and Jackson Park can store 450,000 gallons of stormwater underneath the park. It was a $20 million redevelopment agreement uh, that we were able to provide in uh, by providing them additional incentives to giving them more units in the development. Uh, and ultimately, this is on the western side of the city, when, which is one of the areas with the highest level of flood risk, and it's also located uh, near our housing authority. And we are able to provide an additional community center as part of uh, the incentive package for that project. Um, this is the City Hall Green Infrastructure Project we are, I was referencing a minute ago. These are uh, rain gardens, cisterns uh, on the Bottom right hand corner, we have uh, concrete. This is a demonstration project. People can come and eat lunch there. Uh, we have canopy set up, and there's little education pieces about why it's important for uh, green infrastructure. Um, we incorporated it into our uh, $22 million uh, street redesign project. We talk about something, a uh, microgrid project we incorporated in this a little later, but uh, we were able to do 15 rain gardens, 10,000 gallons a piece, 150,000 gallons of rainwater is a pretty significant. Uh, Retention, I'm sorry, detention. Detention is when you get to leave after you've been bad. Retention is they keep you there forever. <laughs> so that's, that's how I remember that. Um, uh, we've also incorporated uh, pump stations, two different pump stations. This is part of the discharge strategy. So what we were just discussing was delay strategies. These are discharge strategies which help uh, pump water out of the city. So we have one 50 million gallon per day pump at the south end. Uh, you have one 40 million gallon per day pump at the north end. Uh, and then our store strategies are really been incorporating our parks. And, uh, Block 12 was opened last year. This is an uh, artistic rendering, but I didn't have time to put the new renderings of the park being opened in here. Um, this is a project that stores, uh, I think, I, I want to say almost 200,000 gallons underneath the park, but it also has surface stormwater. So again, education component on top, conveyance on top, but storage uh, on the bottom. And there's something, we have an opti sensor installed here, which enables, enables our sewage authority to control the outflow from the park. Um, and that's greatly reduced uh, ponding on the streets on the western side of the city. Um, this is just another rendering of the park. Um, we have, each of these are different practices we put in, but basically street bias fails, so incorporating little discrete measures into some of our construction projects. 
Uh, and we're also going to expand into uh, Block 10, which is the adjacent vacant lot next to Block 12. Um, and our big project that we're working on right now is in 2016, we acquired uh, six acres at the north end of the city of Hoboken. It's the largest uh, resiliency park in the northeast that I'm aware of. Uh, we are going to do uh, about 750,000 gallons of surface storage, a million gallons of subsurface storage. The acquisition alone is a $30 million project, and we think the actual build-out is going to be somewhere around $40 million, but we're trying to keep that uh, number low. And we're working right now to submit a pre-disaster mit mitigation application to FEMA, um, and that's a funding tool that's accessible to a number of different agencies and programs, and um, they're actually opening a new uh, program. So they have a pre-disaster mitigation resiliency program, which they're trying to look at a little differently than their typical benefit-cost analysis. Um, and the other layer of that, I think that Congress recently passed new legislation that the prior year's hurricane damage will fund, a percentage of that will fund the next year's pre-disaster mitigation. So as hurricane damage increases, the pre-disaster mitigation monies are going to increase as well. Um, and the concept for this park started with a company called Reinvest, and they were looking at how to uh, store stormwater underground working out of uh, Rotterdam. And ultimately what that means for us is on the surface of this project, we're going to have uh, a soccer field, a pavilion, a lawn, and then on the northeast side, we're going to have different gardens and rain gardens. Uh, but underneath the project, and similarly to our Block 12 project, we're going to have a cistern, a pumping station, uh, and stormwater management. So really taking that idea from Rebuilt by Design, which is uh, really good uh, form, but marrying that to really good underlying function, uh, and thinking about how we can uh, continue to plan our parks really effectively. So I don't think we need to go all through these bullet items, but what we've gone through is uh, the resist element of the project, which is keeping storm surge out of the city of Hoboken, the delay storm discharge elements of the project, which is managing stormwater once it's in the city. Now I'm going to transfer, transfer over and move towards some of like where we're heading and what the issues they're dealing with now that relate to transportation and just give me a wave when our, our time is up. So Hoboken has, and Jose and I were talking about this, Hoboken's really gone through the transformation similar to a lot of the different waterfronts in the New York City area. So this is our Pierre Park. Um, Mayor Ball is actually in the city of Boston presenting some of the slides that you're going to see right now because we are right now with the city of Hoboken is fighting uh, to uh, maintain this vision of our waterfront. So since you've given me the, the regional platform, I'm going to plug uh, the city, what the city of Hoboken would like to see on this site. So um, we have transitioned from kind of this little bedroom community across from uh, Manhattan into this, uh, in, in the early 1900s, you have this very industrialized waterfront. Uh, it was the point of disembarkment for uh, World War I. Uh, they used to say heaven, hell, or Hoboken because it was, uh, I think, it was that bad back then. Um, and in the 1950s, this is a very uh, a high, high residential area now, but in the 1950s, we still had a working waterfront. Um, and this is the north end of the city of Hoboken. Uh, and this is kind of that, that use that Union Dry Dock wants to continue. So right now, they're uh, pushing to have New York Waterways relocate a refueling uh, facility. and. Uh, a boat docking station at a Union Dry Dock, uh, which is a parcel I'm going to show you in just a minute. But uh, I just want you to, to think about where Hoboken has come from with its industrial waterfront and uh, heavy use that uh, we've had to really change and fight for to get uh, Pier C Park, uh, Pier A Park. We have uh, this is Bob Dillman concert we just hosted. Uh, this is Pier 13. And this is the uh, area immediately adjacent to the Union Dry Dock site. Um, and if you look from north to south, uh, Hoboken's waterfront is green, it's recreational, it's active. Uh, and so this is the Union Dry Dock site that New York Waterways just purchased. Uh, and uh, what they would like to do here is keep it as a, a dry dock and a maintenance facility. So the kayakers you just saw a second ago were right to the north of this at, at Maxwell Park. Um, and so the city of Hoboken is opposed to that, and the city of Hoboken is opposed to that because we believe there are better alternatives in the region that can still provide the access to New York Waterways needs. Uh, so we went through and did an alternatives analysis report, and we looked at better sites. So a site um, at Hoboken Terminal, uh, which is existing ferry bays, as you can see uh, kind of on the bottom right. 
Uh, there's the Bay and Peninsula, and again, uh, looking at the characteristics of what they might need, uh, and then the Binghamton Ferry site, which is further north of our project area, and then also evaluating the Union Dry Dock site within the same study. Um, and what that said was out of the four or five different areas that we had looked at, uh, Hoboken's Union Dry Dock site was ranked fourth, and right now the mayor is um, down in Austin trying to figure out how to uh, politically and, and, dip and design uh, a solution to this issue. It's something I've been tasked with working on as a chief resiliency officer, and, and the challenge right now is that uh, New York Waterways provides an absolutely critical service uh, for cross-Hudson uh, traffic, and New York Waterways has been a great partner in moving people uh, from Hoboken across to Manhattan, and, and also is a, an emergency operation uh, after 9-11, moving people from lower Manhattan over to the west side in Hoboken. So uh, while we want to support New York Waterways options, we think that there are better alternatives that uh, while the services that they provide are absolutely critical, we think that there are other alternatives for siting uh, their operations that might be more consistent with what a working waterfront looks like, which we don't necessarily think is uh, the middle of the city of Hoboken. So another project that we're working on uh, that's pretty interesting, so these two images are of contractors installing conduit. So since uh, 2013, we've been working on a municipal microgrid project. Um, and what that means is that we have a utility provider in the city of Hoboken who provides reliable service. We define resilient service as something where you've had uh, redundancy or above, something that goes above and beyond uh, a traditional, uh, what they call rate, what we pay for, um, because the critical nature of city services. Um, we are looking to build a microgrid, and so what that is is it's distributed energy in one way or another. Uh, software to control uh, the energy distribution, um, uh, conduits or other means of distributing energy between buildings, uh, and you need to have loads as well uh, to service. And uh, what we're hoping to do is build an islandable microgrid, which means we can uh, provide power to our critical services in the event that our service provider uh, loses the ability to do so. And we are uh, doing that with uh, by basically doing electrical line drawings and uh, doing feasibility studies. So our first feasibility study with Sandia National Labs, um, and primarily we say natural gas backup generators. So our generators have been installed. Uh, what we're working on right now, if you look at um, the red diagrams, we're looking at uh, installing the automatic transfer switches and parallel and switch gear, as well as new transformers. Um, but the first image we began the presentation with is what our, uh, the microgrid medium voltage feeder. We're installing that as part of our road projects. Um, that's part of our capital planning efforts. We're trying to look ahead and see where we can uh, piggyback other investments onto what we are already know, which is going to happen on our roads. Um, and so when we originally started out, we thought that this was going to be maybe a $50 million project. San Diego National Labs works for the DOD, so cost savings is not necessarily a design driver for them. Uh, so we had to go back and retool our strategy a little bit. Um, and we started working with other organizations. We worked with the Board of Public Utilities and Department of Energy and Concord and Engineering. Uh, and one of the things we did was we went and worked with Rocky Mountain Institute, which is the Think Take Out West, and they have something called the Electricity Innovation Lab. And they looked at how we could monetize the benefits of the microgrid into a business model uh, that creates a different rate case. So right now, New York State is doing that with New York Prize, and they're working with New York CERTA uh, to try and figure out what is the appropriate cost of this service if, if the utility is going to provide it. Uh, we did that on our own a little bit, and we're working with BPU to kind of uh, push that further out in the state of New Jersey. Um, and where we are right now is we have four focus areas. We have line drawings for those focus areas to figure out what kind of generation we need, how do we connect it to other facilities, uh, and what, if any, benefits accrue if we uh, sequence this program. So basically, uh, can we take smaller bites of the apple, which is how we've approached every one of our projects, is we just try to get the foot in the door, and if the idea is good enough, the funding uh, tends to follow. Um, and so what that looks like for us is the long yellow line is the conduit that we've installed. Uh, the blue dots are generators. Uh, some of these sites, not all of these sites, we've installed generation. We have about uh, three megawatts of generation installed at a number of different sites throughout the city. So if you think about the north end of the city being protected with the resist barrier, the south end being protected by the resist area, and a microgrid powering in the middle of the city, uh, we plan to be open for operation about as soon as possible. This ties into 
uh, New Jersey Transit could. Uh, they have a 100 megawatt facility that they're looking to do for uh, emergency energy to keep uh, trains running in New Jersey. So now, um, if we have a few minutes before, five minutes, great. So all of this and a lot of what you've seen today uh, has a lot to do with systems thinking and, um, and it has a lot to do with trying to identify nodes and intersections uh, and capitalize on current monies that are being spent. So um, one of the things that I have not incorporated into my work yet, but what I've done with seventh and eighth graders, as well as what I've done with my graduate students, um, is a process called Lego Serious Play. Um, and Lego Serious Play um, has to do with creating a story and telling a story and helping people understand what you're trying to say and seeing if you can model landscapes or find interconnections between different city systems. And that's a gross overgeneralization, but the idea is to begin to uh, build as a team or as an individual. So in the, in the middle, at the bottom, uh, the directive is to build a duck. And people have many, many different responses to that, but some of them look like ducks and other some don't look like ducks. And then for the top image and the left image, uh, the idea was to build a tower. So on the far left, this group chose to build the highest tower they could, and they ended up winning. And the group in the middle built Trump Tower, and they made it look like Donald Trump a little bit. And so <laughs> I thought that, that was pretty creative. So you have an individual design response, you have a group design response, and then on the far right is a model of resist, delay, store, discharge, which is each group building a piece of the system, using uh, assigning meaning to the different Lego blocks, and then finding the different connections between the systems. So this is uh, both a way to retain information, uh, it's a way to do team building, uh, but it's also a way to understand the intersections between different systems. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I like to think about and use when we try to break down systems and the two different drivers for resiliency is how can we reduce vulnerabilities uh, and how can we build adaptive capacity? adaptive capacity. And when you think about doing those two things, you have to think about how systems thinking plays into those because they're not, it's not necessarily the same. And I, and I like to think about resiliency where if you're reducing risk, that's a hazard mitigation project, project, and if you're building adaptive capacity, then you're moving more towards what resiliency means. Um, and to do that, you can think about different exercises for systemic thinking um, so what just happened, we had a hurricane. Uh, what have we done to anticipate? We have an Office of Emergency Management that gets run up by the city. Uh, what have we done to design our way out of this issue? So what, what are the codes, ordinances, standards, policies that the cities have adopted? But then mental models, how do we transform that? And that means transforming culture. So when you start to look at the different layers of an issue, so uh, let's say we have a bridge failure. If you were to do an iceberg exercise over a bridge failure, so with the tap and Z replacement or any, any of these things that are happening, we see uh, you know, subway uh, failures or, or slower ridership times, or all of these things have underlying means behind them. So this is just another tool that we're thinking about with uh, systems thinking. And uh, doing those exercises at work, so we have done the iceberg model, what that ultimately produced for us is a uh, a map, an online tool that we use, uh, and we plot every single one of our projects that we anticipate doing over the next six years. We look at how they intersect with the other projects, and we figure out how to best spend uh, the very limited resources we have in the city. So uh, this is just a screenshot of, of what we put on there, but you'll notice that there's a tremendous amount of overlap, and it has a lot to do with our water, our sewer, and our road replacement projects. And uh, when you start to think about how valuable the right-of-way is, you know that you can basically build a new city over time if you just have a little bit of foresight to do that. So we, uh, looking at the information we were able to gain, uh, we engaged with the Stevens Institute of Technology and hired a PhD student to say, can we improve the information that we have? So one of the things that's coming up on the horizon for the city of Hoboken uh, uh, there's legislation, uh, authorizing legislation called, uh, that will enable us to do a stormwater utility. For us to build a stormwater utility, we need to understand the, what level of imperviousness we have within the city. So the data set that we started with on the left is from the NJDP, and that looked at uh, level of impervious surfaces throughout the city, but it was not on a parcel level, it was more on a block level. Uh, and what we were able to do is refine that information down on a parcel by parcel basis 
to actually get an accurate snapshot of what the perviousness of a specific parcel was. And once we know that, we can assign a value to their contribution to our storm sewer system. So stormwater utility is kind of a forgotten utility where rainwater or stormwater management is something that's not directly tied to a user fee, and most of our other systems are, so energy or wastewater or water. Uh, so what we're trying to do, and all the other things on this page are not important except for the very top right, which is we're trying to figure out the building area of a specific parcel and the percentage of the area on that parcel that is a yard, or we call that pervious, and an area that's not part of the yard that's impervious. And we are going to assign a, a value to how much rainwater they're contributing during different storm events, and we can, begin to, we can begin to investigate whether or not there should be a user fee associated with that contribution. So this isn't something that's gone before our city council. It's not something uh, that we've discussed outside of uh, this academic exercise. Um, but we think that by preparing and getting better data, we can kind of anticipate where the future of stormwater management is heading. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. We covered a lot of territory. So thank you guys for your time. Really appreciate it.